Which okay, say, well, let, let me let me give let, let me give you a tiny a heads up. Um, yeah. In an act of amazing time, and I've got a guy looking at my washing machine. <laughs> <laughs> so that's going to kick off any moment. So, so that's happening right this second. I, I don't think he needs me, but at some point he'll go, I'm done here. Cheerio. And that'll be, <laughs> so that's, that's likely to happen. That's I don't okay. that. Uh, we edit this down into a half hour podcast. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, we say chat- edit down. I'm normally like, does that mean, does that imply you can go on and on and on and on? <laughs> oh, God, forever? yeah. Oh, please do. I mean, anybody who goes on and on and on as a gift to a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and um, also, I'm a bit rusty because I, I did a whole bunch of these in May and June and mm. then uh, got busy. I've been doing classes. I've been all over the place. In fact, Paul, I've been to uh, Belfast International Airport, skirted but... so close to you. But then I went off to Enniskillen. So oh, okay, I, well, I, and I didn't really touch Belfast, but I've been <laughs> in your neck of the woods because uh, Paul's in uh, Belfast and Emma, you're where? I'm down in Shepherd's Bush in London. Oh, TV you. studios, that's all uh, I know. Shepherd's Bush clears uh, <laughs> up instantly TV studios and uh, 018-118-055. Oh, that's... my God, <laughs> Saturday morning kids TV. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's largely, I think, ITV now own most of that complex and the rest has become mm. fancy flats. But, yeah, that's, I still that's get where a they bit tried to read it song. for the BBC. Is that's that, right that's, yes yeah oh god read a map guys um yeah <laughs> television center has not been television center for a long long time um yeah. although yeah there are itb's good morning britain studios to down there uh but yeah i still get a free song whenever i see the building it's just such a reminder oh, of be, saturday cool. morning kids tv or saturday evening variety there is something about that curvy front with the big dots on that just says yeah. 1980s TV. Iconic. Mm. I was really pleased I actually got to do a couple of things there. I actually got to perform in the studio that they made used to make Top of the Pops in with my Scottish falsetto Sock Puppet Theatre uh, wow. in 2007. So that was really good. Got to go into oh, one of those changing awesome. rooms, which had probably had some sort of atrocity. Co- uh, co- uh, yeah. <laughs> And uh, yeah, oh. going, going through that. Oh, don't worry, it doesn't dwell thinking on, does it? Really? <laughs> I'm, I'm burning sage here. I'm burning sage. <laughs> and going into the old this. classic entrance. The old classic entrance way, which what by that time wasn't even the entrance way. It was just a sort of side bit. But mm. yeah, that was all part of our childhood. All right, should we start a podcast? Sounds yeah, like yeah, a great go on, idea. Then. <laughs> I've got your images ready to upload uh, whenever Ooh. I decide to. Well, so, these are the same image I've sent you like nine times. Yeah, I'm I... sorry, because Paul was <laughs> lined up to do this way back in. It must have been June that I had yes. you lined up. And then the other person couldn't do yours, so we had to delay yours and, until right. then. Right. Uh, it wasn't you, Emma. You weren't. Uh, you weren't. I can't no, remember. No, no. I'm a. I'm a. I'm a late edition. Because yeah, <laughs> I'm. Not, I'm not a comic person other than a consumer thereof i that's okay most, i struggle most, with stick figures to be honest uh, most of the people <laughs> who have done the podcast haven't been comics practitioners i've had uh, comedians uh, entertainers writers people in other fields and uh, now you guys so um we'll have a wee bit chat between the two of us and then i'll select one person's image to look at first and then the other of us will try and guess what it is and we'll chat and then vice versa. Um, okay. I'm recording everybody on separate tracks. Is anybody recording themselves? I know just Paul, do you want me to? Good... I can record or audio I can if do you that. want. If you guys can record yourselves, they'll we'll get a clean feed without sure. that Zoom cutting out thing that happens. Yes. Do you, Have do you, you want tried me... using Zencaster, by the way? I love that because it records everyone locally on their machine and then uploads it. Uh, right, yeah. Um, there's a few of these things that have been suggested to me, but simply because of the obligation it places on the person at the other end, I, right. haven't, I haven't bothered to do it. Sure, I've been sure. Keeping it as simple as I can means that some people record soundtracks because they're used to, and that's great, and they always have mm-hmm. better sound than me, and some people don't. Right, we're right. going to begin um, like this. Hello and welcome to Ooh, Comic. Oh, hang on. Oh, what's happening there? Oh, sorry, you're not recording yet. I've, that that was rather pre- presumptuous of me. Hang on, hang on. Oh, sorry, sorry, Kevin. I, no, I tried I to d- record my audio. I hadn't preempted this. I so. can't hear any audio. Hang on, something something happened there. Can, can you speak in? Uh, one one two one two testing testing. Oh, no. We're talking at my end. I can't hear a thing. <laughs> hang on. Aha. How how ah. many roadies does it take to change a light bulb? One two. 
One, two, one, two. One, two, one, two. No, no, uh, I could no. also, of course, there's always likely to be broadband Something's problems. going wrong at my end here. I'm going to leave and then come back. Leave Are you back. sure? Okay, okay. Yeah. I think sometimes changing the audio settings while you're in a meeting really does like make zoom yeah. poop its pants but this technology has been fantastic hasn't it i mean were you so were you doing anything like this before the lockdown um so we were planning on doing a podcast uh and looking at it and going oh studios are so big. don't worry oh, because of i'm I have... just recording on an external voice recorder on my phone so right. yeah. and i yeah, i have just started recording here and actually paul your set your paul Paul, your sound sounds great from here. Okay. So, and, and okay. It, it's bound to sound better than mine because mine always ends up sounding a little bit tinny. <laughs> uh, right. What you need is uh, a big old mic like this with a comedy yeah. scuffle. Uh, yeah. My housemate I, is addicted to audio. I've got, I've got the death got, star. Oh, look it's, at that. Oh, very nice. Is that a blue as well? Uh, it's a blue, yeah. It's yeah. no moon. It's a blue. <laughs> Mine's the Yeti underneath that ridiculous bottle. Uh, uh, I got the That Is No Moon reference. Yay! <laughs> when I was pregnant, I went to see the new Star Wars movie and I wore this white T-shirt that was stretched over my belly and I just wrote That's No Moon with a <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Yes, I still always struggle with Star Wars. I'm trying to watch The Mandalorian and more than any previous Star Wars, you just keep thinking, this is just a Western. This script would be one of those, we have Talking Pictures TV on in the morning and they have old Westerns on the weekend, old Western TV serials. And the storyline of Mandalorian is just one of those. Oh, mm -hmm. kidnaps the guy, gets double cross, shooting in a quarry. They literally do what, nothing that is, else. That's what I love about it. Given, yeah. <laughs> you quite, I, I can see why it appeals because it is very straightforward and mm. it, it de deliberately uncomplicated and unsophisticated uh whereas i'm getting into the marvel's uh universe tv series uh, later than everybody else everybody was talking about these last year and i'm now watching we've watched wandavision and we're watching uh, loki and absolutely mm. loving them and they couldn't be more complicated and yet you realize that it's complicated but an eight to twelve year old can also follow it in fact mm. it's for them Mm. Yeah. But it's not insulting to us. It's brilliant. I loved how WandaVision played with the different stylistic tropes of the different eras and how immersive that felt. I just, yeah, yeah. I, I loved that. And the, the lens that they went to to recreate the 1950s filming environment, including those enormous like Klieg lights that everyone was apparently sweating under. Yeah, well, reading but, but yeah. the, the background of the production of it. And the big difference, because the thing I'm always comparing these things to is Doctor Who, because I'm a big Doctor Who fan. And both Loki and WandaVision did Doctor Who things, but they did them in a way that Doctor Who had done better. That way of making mm. it kid friendly, so you can watch it when you're eight to 12, Doctor Who has to do that. But Doctor Who especially recently has been guilty of either writing down down, which the new series have mm. done or in Stephen Moffat's case pandering to old people you know mm. you have to be 50 to have understood all the references <laughs> where with WandaVision yeah. if you don't get the references it's okay you can look them up and if, you know if you've never heard of I Dream of Jeannie or um, I Love Lucy or whatever programs they're doing Dick Van Dyke show that's okay you can look them up but you know there's something to look up and that's all you need to know mm. it's exactly the right way that round for introducing the, the, people the, the, to the biggest the biggest gap between the age uh, appropriateness of the show and a gag for your parent that I've ever seen was uh, in Pixar's, um, oh, what's, it, what's the one about emotions? It's the one where it's all emotional stuff. Uh, Inside, uh, Inside Out. Out. Yeah, Inside Out. There's a bit in it where something happens and it's this sort of cloudy part of the imagination. There's buildings made out of clouds. Something happens and there's two kind of cops one i think one's a donut and one's something else and uh something happens and one cop turns to the other and goes forget it jake it's cloud town and it's, oh! <laughs> it's like, well that's a reference i'm gonna have to explain to my child <laughs> Do you know, funny, I spotted that reference um, also in Hot Fuzz and I hadn't noticed it before. Yeah. It was Forget It, it's uh, Sandersford or whatever the village is called. Yeah. yeah. And I hadn't I hadn't clicked the Chinatown <laughs> reference first time I saw that. <laughs> oh, look, we're supposed to be doing a podcast. We've done too much yeah. interesting chat. <laughs> We've done TV we and not comics. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, okay. we did at least mention Marvel. That counts. 
Well, I'm going to have to take all this stuff and stick it in later. At the other end, yeah. Unless, of course, we say something more interesting. Okay, we begin officially now. Hello, and welcome to Comic Cuts, the panel show. My name's Kev F. Sutherland. You might know me as a writer and artist for Beano, Marvel Comics, Oink, Doctor Who, the Scottish Falsetto Sock Puppet Theatre, and my graphic novel adaptations of Shakespeare. But chances are, you probably don't. My guests today, talking comics, are Emma Byrne and PJ Holden. Hello. 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 Hi. And now I do the theme music, but I do it live. Do we dance? Sure. Do we sing along? Comic cut. Uh, we're looking at a panel, and we comprise a panel. There's a few of us, so the panel sees a panel, and we talk about comics from a panel we discuss, and we call it comic cuts. <laughs> I mean, you, you've, you're welcome Quite to have much. danced and sung along, uh, <laughs> but I, I, I unfortunately didn't know the lyrics. <laughs> I don't. I'm not entirely sure I did either. <laughs> I have two guests with me today who've brought with them a panel from a comic or something close. We're going to see if we can identify it and talk about it. Maybe we and you will learn something about comics we didn't already know. Or maybe we'll just show off a bit and have an enjoyable chat. Let's see. Uh, joining us from Shepherd's Bush is Emma. Uh, Emma Byrne. Hello. Good morning, Emma. Hi, Kev. Nice to see you. We mentioned Shepherd's Bush and immediately uh, Paul leaps in with that's the TV studios because that's all we picture in Shepherd's Bush, except the TV studios aren't there anymore, are they? They're not, or at least the building is there, but now it's mainly swanky flats. Um, ITV have a bit of the basement and there's a bit of BBC. I think BBC Worldwide has some offices just on the campus, but it is still so evocative of all of that sort of Saturday morning kids TV or Saturday evening variety shows. Uh, it, yeah, it really does feel sort of like 1980s heyday BBC output every time I walk past it, even though now it's mainly just sort of cafes and, and flats and, and a staggering view of Westfield uh, but Shepherd's Bush is evocative of either that or only fools and horses for me. Well interestingly there's another uh, there's a TV show that was set in Shepherd's Bush a sitcom and I think there was a joke about the fact that they were in Shepherd's Bush and filmed in Shepherd's Bush. Step two and son. Ah yes of course and the bush still has that oh get me local I only moved here about three years ago from East London but um, the bush still <laughs> has that, that amazing difference of I think because it's very cheap real estate there was the um I think it's the palais down in Shepherd's Bush um that became one of the first TV variety studios that's actually on the green you've got all the wet you know you, you're on a straight run out to Ealing and still I see sort of Panavision lorry trucks and prop hire trucks going back and forth there's still a lot of filming because we're just on the boundary of a lot of old industrial uh real estate and and just great big places where you can do filming but not so far out that you can't get you know an executive producer to get on the tube or <laughs> get a cab or something so it's it's that wonderful place where you know industrial and market and cheap stuff and the rag trade, so much rag trade, smacks up against the sort of slightly more glamorous part of production. And as someone who, when I do theatre in that, definitely does much more of the dark side stuff, someone who is very happy in crew blacks, there is something about Shepherd's Bush that I love. It feels like the industrial side of the TV industry still is all that heritage, which I, I seriously dig. Paul, did you ever get to Shepherd's Bush in the TV centre? In its day, no, but, no, but the, the like England, England, all of that was a, a mythical beast to me. Like it was, you know, Ealing. Well, I instantly think of the old black and white Ealing comedies on BBC Two. What's really interesting, I think, is that um, that's sort of that's all evocative of the TV and film for me from my childhood. Where I and I'm in Belfast, so you know, we had a, I had a different kind of childhood growing up here. But like for the next generation coming along. Belfast and Northern Ireland is going to evoke things like Game of Thrones and Krypton and all these other TV shows that were made here. So it's sort of been an interesting, you know, TV and film were a thing that, that 
happens somewhere else that doesn't um, doesn't exist here, and then suddenly it does now. So it's it's kind of interesting watching the change in Northern Ireland as, as film studios are are sort of springing up in the Titanic quarter, which is where the Titanic was built, but essentially all big empty docklands, and then they've massive film studios there, and they still have some of the set of Game of Thrones and stuff down there. So um, it's 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 kind of but it's I mean you know new new modern TV ha you can keep it. Give me multicolored swap shop and you know black and white See, comedies and I'm that's good. Yeah, my first exposure to the Belfast accent was probably why don't you growing up? They oh, they, God, they would yeah. occasionally go to a school in Belfast. Yeah, yeah, that was a thing that I I've always bemoaned the loss of regional ITV because they had a remit when they set up that regional ITV right at the end of the 1960s that something had to come from all of the regional studios. So um, Northern Ireland had to produce something to get broadcast hmm. nationally. I can't remember what they actually produced, but they must have done something. I know. Well, I, I, I can I tell you. A... I can tell you when I was a kid. I wasn't on Why Don't You, but I was on. There was a TV show filmed, uh, and I was about. It's eight or nine or something I think I was interviewed for it it was about aliens come down to planet earth and go around and they interview all these kids about what they think the world is like and and it so it was the kind of it was probably book ended by aliens but it really t interviews with kids from and I, and I was one of the kids and it was and I I can vaguely remember how embarrassing some of the things were I'll not, I'll not repeat them because they were awful uh, and uh, but I we never got to see it because it was pre video tape recorders and uh -huh. all of that stuff so I, I know it was broadcast but i've no idea what was said on it well it's interesting isn't it we all had this childhood fascination with the uh, space age and fantasy and th <laughs> there wasn't so much of it around as there is now but both of you have gone into the worlds of science both science real and science fiction now paul the science fiction world emma you're actually a robot scientist <laughs> you're you're the sort of person we used to read about what is yeah what exactly i am... is a robot scientist well, I spent a long time reading Isaac Asimov growing up um, oh, and I decided that I wanted I wanted Susan Calvin's job. I, I sort of missed the misogynistic tropes at the time and just wanted Susan Calvin's job. And I was lucky enough for, I spent a good few years in uh, labs that sort of straddle neuroscience and artificial intelligence, um, either looking at ways of reproducing uh, I did some stuff reproducing the primate visual system and the various layers in that and seeing if we could use that to uh, help a, a virtual robot navigate a essentially it was like levels of doom, uh, but whether we could get it to learn language doing that uh, with a collaborator at, at Middlesex University that was that was amazing uh, some other stuff at UCL in the Science Museum looking at how we learn to see how evolution has has created this vast variety of sensory input in the electromagnetic spectrum um, I yeah I've, I've got to tinker with some fantastic stuff I am now mainly a full-time writer I haven't been near a lab in a little while I do miss it um, yeah, it's, it's fun when I still get to, to volunteer for experiments or go and just sort of line an fMRI tube for a bit. But yeah, mainly now I'm writing up other people's research in books about either swearing or kids or well, yes, swearing that's... about so, kids. So, so, or... just, so, just so I'm clear, just so yeah. I'm clear, you're a scientist who's worked on robots and not an actual robot scientist. <laughs> As far as I know, just, just so, I can try to try to stabbing between my fingers, but I think <laughs> I think I'm human. It's just it's very confusing language, Kev. Just you know, just to know. highlight good, that, flag that good up. Point. I should have been using better punctuation there, shouldn't I? Because <laughs> uh, Emma, you've then taken the scientific principle and applied it to most entertainingly swearing. Yes. You're, yeah. you're looking at. Is it very much the science of swearing, the application of swearing? That's right. So when I was working in the lab that was based out of the Science Museum, we were participating in something called the Science Museum Lates, which is they, they open up, they kick all the kids out at sort of 6pm, close for an hour or so, set up a bunch of bars and then have a load of people coming in over the age of 18 to basically have the run of the museum and listen to some interesting talks and participate in some experiments. 
I say experiments, they are definitely more demonstrations because wherever alcohol is involved, you find that your results get more erratic as the night goes on. <laughs> uh, but I was looking at cool experiments that I could do or demonstrations of experimental setups. And I came across the um, the ice water challenge or the ice water test. It's called the cold presser test. And you stick your hand in a bucket of ice water and see if you, how long you can keep it in when repeating a neutral word versus how long you can keep it in when you're repeating a swear word. And there's some really nice uh, things that allow this experiment to be fairly well controlled. There's a, a chap called Rich Stevens at the University of Kiel who came up with it. But long story short is when you control for things like the order in which you do it or how easy it is to remember these, these different words, you can keep your hands in ice water in general about a third longer when swearing than when not. And I thought this was fascinating. And I, I did what all researchers do, which is you read the paper and then you read all the references in the back of the paper and then you go and read those papers, and then you read the references in those. And before I knew it, I had a stack of papers on my desk that was about sort of three foot high and in peril of, you know, I'd murdered a forest going, this is all about swearing. And I was just <laughs> boring on about swearing to everybody that I could talk to. Um, and around that time, I did a, a BBC training course. Um, and part of that was to pitch a radio show. I pitched a sort of 15 minutes on the science of swearing, which was picked up by Radio 4 and then from that it just it grew and it grew and eventually we ended up with this yeah this book called Swearing is Good for You. Fantastic and so swearing is ultimately good for you that's the conclusion of your scientific research. Yeah, I, what, what just... I find what I what I find interesting about that is there's a kind of you've got to I mean from a purely taking the science aspect out of that you've got to ask yourself is is there a kind of magic to it you know the idea of of words having a, a power over physics uh, you know <laughs> having a power over your own physical body is is kind of interesting i mean taking out all the science stuff you you've got essentially if you cast if you say this magic word you are slightly stronger which is kind of it's another way of looking at it but it's, yeah you know. i mean the magic happens in the brain and the fact that swearing draws on so many different parts of the mm. brain that our normal everyday language doesn't so yeah. we see activity in parts of the brain that are to do with emotion with social cognition with uh recognizing threats and so on uh which is why for example when people have strokes that affect their general language they can quite often remain quite fluent swearers which is something yeah. that people who you know are caring for someone who's, who's had a stroke can be quite stunned by you know this yeah. person can no longer you know whisper term, terms of endearment but can can say something incredibly rude and it's nothing yeah. personal and it's not to do with their personality it's just that languages uh in, in computer science we call it redundancy the idea that you have multiple systems that can perform the same function and if one fails another will kick in and swearing yeah. is hugely redundant in the brain uh which is yeah that alone is <laughs> just, just in that case. Other, yeah there are very few things in our brain that are quite so distributed we'd better uh, keep that F word in about seven different places because who knows when we'll need it who knows when we'll need it and yes the the brain injuries that lead you to not ever swear at all are far rarer and tend to need to be far more specific than the brain injuries that can damage the rest of language it's really hmm. interesting it's, it's well swe i mean it's, it is. it's swearing so i mean presume i'm presuming from what you're saying is that it's the cultural kind of knowledge that your brain builds up from a swear word that means that if you took the same test with a swear word into Russia to non-native English speakers and asked them to speak the English swear word, it doesn't fire up the same neurons. Uh, exactly. And, and that's interesting. So that, I mean, and, but can, can you then, is, is that something that you have to learn as a child and th th those neural pathways have to build up from youth or can yeah. you learn a new swear word in later years that is as powerful? Yeah, there is a fantastic professor. I think her name is Aisha Gonshu, uh, who is uh, Turkish American, and she's done loads of studies on bilingual people and found that if these are swear words that you learn before the end of your adolescence, they create the same physiological changes in the body and, and create the same emotional impacts um, in both languages. But if you become bilingual as an adult and you learn these swear words in a second language, you tend not to have them uh, creating such strong emotional and physiological responses. There seems to be a 
a critical window in which we learn what is swearing. And it also explains why swearing is so generational, um, that if you look at things like we were talking about broadcasting earlier, if you look at the Ofcom survey of what people find offensive, mm. it does change over the decades. And mm -hmm. it seems, you know, sort of perplexing to our parents, the things that we I, don't think are rude. I, I remember when my gran had, a gran's friend was referring to dad's car number plate. And uh, it was a, a, a B registration car back in the 1980s. And she said, oh, and he's got that new B car. Oh, and she covered her mouth because B, which stood for bloody, was mm. the closest to a swear word that she, uh, somebody born in the 1910s, would ever dare get. Mm. She would never mm. have said that word in her life. And that was uh, as offensive as she, she could get then in her 70s. So, yeah. um, and, and swearing uh, and kids is an interesting thing for you, Paul, because in 2000 AD, they always had a parallel language of swearing, uh, drock and grexniks and uh, stom. Yeah. Now, yeah. Uh, now you're allowed more language, but there must still be a cutoff limit in 2000. Well, I don't. I don't think there is. I mean, 2080 is not an adult comic. There's no, you know, there's no pretending that that, that it's not. So there, there is proper swearing there. There is a kind of uh, because a lot of the readership are older, and because a lot of the readership grew up reading the comic, there's still a kind of fondness for those made-up swear words. But there's also a kind of uh, there's a slightly cheesy quality to some of them. I mean, Drock is still used even you know people who read the comic will still sometimes say drock as as an exclamation on news groups and uh, how old am i a news group um on, <laughs> <laughs> on facebook uh whatever are, are, um, are you telemetting into that <laughs> yes yes um and uh, yeah, when people when they send telegrams to each other drock all over the place um so uh, yeah, it's still it's still definitely used as as a as a kind of swear word but it's I mean, it's like the history of it is that 2008 came out of Action Comics. Action Comics was so terrible a comic that that they banned it, and 2008 kind of went, "Ooh, we'd better be really careful." And so, well, the only people we'll kill will be aliens. The only blood we'll spill will be green, and the only bad words we'll use will be Drock and Grexnix. And a lot of those words came out of typo, or not typos. Actually, came out of the fact that Jerry Finley Day, who was sort of contributing writer to it, uh, came up with Rogue Trooper and stuff. Um, had dyslexia and so would mistype a lot of them. So, Scrotnik uh, came out of the word escorting, apparently. So, <laughs> oh. so there's, there's a few words like that, as far as I not all of them necessarily, but but a few of them came out of that. And even if you read some of the early 2080s, you'll see spellings and stuff for slightly different. And you can see over the years that it's it's kind of it's changed and stuff. And and so, but it is interesting the words that made it as and you know still sound good as swear words. Drock, Storm. Um, and there, there's a few others that kind of sound like they fit, you know, yeah. they, 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 frack is another one from sci-fi generally, but, I um, I still love you know, frack. Yeah. Well, and yeah there's, there's snack, a... snack is another one from 2080, mm. I think as, as well, which is kind and, of multi uh, snick, which comes from, uh, the, the Chris Claremont's X-Men. There's a whole, mm. a whole world mm. of discussion of, uh, the things that sound sexy, giving people, well, <laughs> at Star, we were talking about Star Wars earlier and people have just plain stupid names. Uh, it's almost yes. like how, how embarrassingly silly can you make these names, but just, uh, you'll only start laughing if you're too old for this show. And that's where all the Star Wars <laughs> names come from. Um, well, when I get stuck with writer's block, I, I, I have never written fiction. I have only ever published, anyway, uh, non-fiction. But if I get really stuck, I sit there and I've got, I know that the first 500 words I write are going to be terrible. Uh, then I, I have this character called Dirk Manley, who is a space explorer with a, a large gun and a, and a fast ship. And, and I have 500 words of, of the doings of Dirk Manley, uh, who is every space operatic trope. Um, and, and they all I do go like straight the, I do like the title. I love yeah. the title, The Doings of Dirk Manley. That's the a, Doings that's of Dirk a... Manley. It's, uh, and there's also a place um, that I was just driving through recently called Beeple's Barton, which to me is definitely a sort of 1920s boys' own adventure type thing. Mm. You know, the, the Beeple's Barton investigates the mystery of the, I don't know, the <laughs> Sapphire Slipper or something. But yeah, Dirk Talk Manley. Talking of these amazing and fantastic creative yes. things, we've also brought some comics with us to look at. Mm. So I'm going to look at our comic panels. Um, I'm going to invite. In I'm going to unveil somebody. Oh Christ! 
I'm going to <laughs> unveil one of the panels that one of us has brought in, and the other two of us will try and guess what it is and talk about it. Uh, listener at home, you can find these hopefully on my website, kevfcomicartist.com, or on the holding artwork wherever you get your podcasts from. But you shouldn't need to see the artwork because we're about to describe it beautifully. And let's have a look at the very first... Paint As an artist, I feel like one of the great skills I have is is painting a, a picture with words. <laughs> <laughs> Good, because it's Emma's turn first. Emma, you oh. are looking now at the image that's been brought in by Paul. Paul, don't tell us anything about this yet. Emma, it's there's a chance you might actually recognise it, but have a guess, or, or rather begin by describing what we're looking at. <clears throat> Okay, so we have six panels, and one of the things that I'm noticing here is I love the gradient of the background. So it starts with this beautiful tealy green that sort of fades out over the panels and comes back to a dark green again. I'm getting this sense of, you know, reality, something is shifting, and then reality again. And we have a character who I'm afraid I don't recognise. They're talking to somebody called Roma, which is obviously a clue, but I don't know this. Um, and they are looking like a somewhat elderly space operatic, uh, possibly baddy. I don't know why. I think I'm getting that from like the lots of green in the background. Uh, that's usually a sort of a witchy colour, isn't it? Saying, show myself, Roma. And then the next panel, but which self? Now we have a, a wizard in full on wizarding gear. You know, the long nails, the purple sleeves, the pointy hat that doesn't have wizard written down it. But uh, it's definitely sort of quite unseen university. And then we have someone who is looking a little bit more like um i don't know somebody who you'd meet at a camera festival maybe uh, or a led zeppelin <laughs> fan definitely definitely something i would say mage this person rolled for for mage for their character uh they have a staff now we've got some kind of slightly furry insectoid uh now we have someone who who looks or oh, this is very much sort of um a villain from flash gordon uh in in sort of very purplish uh yeah lots of purple and green going on here i'm loving this nice opponent colors um so yeah what we're seeing is somebody shape-shifting and challenging someone who has asked them to show themselves and we're getting a sense of the real range of all of these people but they're all they all seem to be males they all definitely rock a beard apart from the uh, the insectoid <laughs> one and then the person who they return to but i don't know who this character is um so well, yes, if I, if I can step in and yeah. for the benefit of the panelologists, people who study mm -hmm. line and drawing technique, this is a black and white line drawing that has been coloured. But because I know the source material, I, I can actually have a good guess at this because I, I own this comic. Mm. This was originally drawn in black and white, intended to be seen in black and white. It's later been coloured and it's been coloured well, but coloured in simple colours probably mm. from the 90s and we're seeing uh, in this black and white line drawing uh, su a superhero style from a, a Marvel comic style of artist and I happen to know this is quite early work by someone who went on to be one of the most famous Marvel comic artists and uh, yes we have a modern superhero version of this wizard then we have a caricature wizard with stars and stars and planets on his pointy hat then we have a new age wizard looking a bit like christopher lee uh with a, a new agey uh hexagram symbol on his chest then we've got a big insect then we've got a uh, ming the merciless meets steve ditko designed costume and then finally we've got the original guy again go on emma have a guess what this is from oh and if you, you can't make, Marvel, make, up a, is... make up a title for it yeah see I am not thinking that this is Stephen Strange. I'm not thinking that Stephen Strange was ever drawn like this. Uh, but that is the only Marvel Universe sort of wizarding person that I know to my great sugar. Um, uh, no, I, I, one of, I... One of the most famous wizards in all of Christendom. <laughs> well, I'm going to say Merlin. <laughs> and I would I would concur that we're looking at Merlin and we're looking at five or six different versions of Merlin, but from a comic uh, written by, I think by this stage, it's written by Alan Moore, isn't it? And drawn by mm -hmm. Alan Davis. And it's from Captain Britain. Are we right, Paul? You're right. 
you're right. Um, See, I mean, does that mean the mid- one of the middle panels is basically Alan Moore doing a self portrait? I mean, this is just well, or it, a portrait it, of Alan Moore. It, it could well be Alan Davis doing a doing a drawing of Alan Moore. It's, it's very very likely. Um, I, I mean, no, my favorite thing about this, Emma, I hate to say this, is that you don't know this, which means I get to expand ex- expand it and tell you how uh-huh. amazing this is and how how your life will be richer for reading this comic and that from uh-huh. this one. So I've cheated slightly. Kevin said one panel and this is one of my favorite panels it is i consider this a single panel but but it is multiple panels because the character is changing shape and it's doing that thing that um the tv can do easily where a character stays the same but you know changes whereas we can't do that in comics so we've got to give you different images but he successfully shows by splitting the dialogue up so uh, essentially what you have is this kind of techno techno wizard guy in in the first panel which is um, merlin Uh, and what's happened in the comic at this stage is that captain britain for it is he has been killed He's been destroyed by this this creature called the Fury. The Fury is this kind of dimension hopping ultimate uh, uh, robot that that has one t- one singular mission, which is to kill all superheroes. And it's this incredible artificial intelligence that can it can sort of it's every time it it needs to fulfill its mission, it changes what its parameters of what it's able to do is. And so it eventually kills Captain Britain. And Merlin at this stage has has rescued. uh, And in this particular strip, sorry, I'm going to I'm going to talk about this all day now. Yeah, Uh, sorry. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> in this this particular strip is from the I think it's from Daredevils or it's from Mighty World of Marvel or something. So they were they were done in six page stories uh, in black and white in I think the eighties or so. Uh, and it was uh, a guy called Dave Thorpe had written Captain Britain and he he put Captain Britain in this kind of altered alternate universe where the actually I, I think Dave Thorpe came up with six one six which is the he did, yes. multiverse of uh, where the where the Marvel universe takes place in the multiverse which is a six one six then has become as the Marvel film and TVs expand into the multiverse we're going to hear the number six one six we're going to see it a lot and that all stems from this strip which is interesting in and of itself but at this stage. Um, the Fury has killed Captain Britain, completely destroyed him, and all that's left, and, and the name of the strip is A Rag, A Bone, and A Hank of Hair. And in this story, Merlin, along with his daughter Roma, and they're in in what's called Otherworld, which is the, the kind of place that Merlin exists in, and they're basically rebuilding Captain Britain, and they're rebuilding him from his DNA, and they're re-injecting him with his memory. And Roma's job is, as Merlin describes, your job is simply to build a body. Mine's is to re is to kind of rebuild a mind to kind of give this person back all of his memories, and everything who he is, and all of his drives and his motivations. And they tweak his power and his armor. Uh, and Roma kind of says, "Shouldn't you show yourself to to the captain? Shouldn't you know? Shouldn't you reveal that you've that you've kind of rebuilt him?" And um, he kind of goes, show myself, but but which self, this one or this? He wouldn't have known me. And in the end, that is for the best. And that's that's that moment from, from the strip. And the last, as, as, as Captain Britain's body is rebuilt, slowly rebuilt, and you can see the circulatory system, and which I think Alan Moore would later revisit as an idea with Captain, uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Manhattan, the kind of the rebuilding from the cell upwards. Uh, you see the body being rebuilt, and you see that, that Captain Britain is placed back on Earth 616, his original Earth. And there's a moment where Captain Britain is standing beside uh, a, a henge, uh, a stone henge, uh, and crying with gratitude that Merlin's plucked him out of the time stream at the moment before he was destroyed and saved him, which of course is not what happens. And uh, that's kind of it's a heartbreaking bit where, where he's so grateful for him, but that's not what Merlin has done at all. Merlin's got his own nefarious plans going on. It's great. It's great. And isn't it interesting, the the things that were being done for the first time in comics fiction then and are now taken for granted as tropes, the time travel, the uh, alternate realities, Earth 616, the parallel universes, things that were being discovered in science and written about in science and being dabbled with, with by writers. Alan Moore, I think one of the first ones to be dabbling with these things with some sort of knowledge of uh, the science that was going on and philosophy that was going on, whereas previously people like Steve Ditko and Stan Lee were just making stuff up. And <laughs> if it happened to coalesce with scientific theories, then that was coincidental. 
Yes, I. I mean, I. I'm not entirely sure how scientifically based it all is. It. It definitely had a a sheen of it, and as I say, I mean, one of the one of the key things, and I mean, one of the reasons I like this panel is that, um, it it essentially says that Merlin particularly shows dif- different aspects of himself depending on what the circumstances are. Yeah. And I think we all do that. I think we do that on Twitter and Facebook and real life. And that's a thing that we all do. And that it's almost impossible to know someone fully in the round because they're always keeping something from someone else. They're always showing something of, of themselves. And that's that's one of the particular reasons I like this panel. But I, I, I you know, I don't know if science will eventually come round to the conclusion that this is the multiverse and we are particularly 616 in that multiverse. I'm not, <laughs> not, <laughs> not sure if that's the position we'll end up with. Well, another thing that was happening here you were describing how we can do this kind of thing on film back in 1981 1982 when this comic strip was happening you couldn't do stuff like that the technology mm. of the last 20 years has been mm. so revolutionary and then yeah. the budgets that people have managed to find to make tv shows like Wonder Vision and Loki I mean so much money spent on a tv show in 1981 can anybody remember the Doctor Who of 1981 because it certainly couldn't have done a special effect <laughs> like this without you laughing <laughs> out loud yeah i mean yeah. it was tricky but things like multiple exposures since you know since man ray and photography but i'm thinking particularly uh, metropolis the ways of overlaying exposures mm. you could do it but it was so prohibitively there, expensive you know, a, the transformation a... from woman to bot back again but it's yeah there's now a great, it's... i can't i can't remember who did it but it's the effect on Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, uh, the old, I think it was Lon Chaney, either Lon Chaney or Lon Chaney Jr. And what, what he'd done was he'd applied a coloured makeup to his face that changed yes. with the light. And mm-hmm. so when they changed the lighting, which of course all looked like, it, because it was black and white and it all looked exactly the same, but when he changed the lighting, which was maybe a green to a red or something, it changed the makeup in his face and that yeah. changed how he looked, which is an incredible effect even to this day. It still yeah. sort of holds up. But yeah, you're right. I mean, the, the thing that's been really interesting as a comic artist is to watch the slow, gradual flip between uh, the, these are things you can only do in comics because we've an infinite budget to these are things you can only do in TV because although you have an infinite budget in in, in um, comics, if you ask your comic artist to draw 10,000 soldiers on, on <laughs> horseback, you're not going to get much of a comic out of them. That's, you know, you're going to kill them by the end of that. So it's been watching that flip has been it was kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah that's, that's very true. Um, and also the amount of money that's spent on making comics big and bright and shiny. I mean, this Captain Britain was originally done in black and white, printed in black mm. and white. And uh, the colour is, is perfunctory. I, I think I'm very well happy. I, I, it was interesting this name to, to, to focus and hone in on the color because to be honest I had never even paid attention to the background color of this before now mm-hmm. it had never occurred to me there was a graduation going on in, in the green to the uh, sort of fading out from a dark green to the other greens and even saying this is a kind of witchy color that's all interesting I kind of wonder if that if there was thinking like that going on or was it more kind of this is the color of fill that we've got on our computer right now so let's just do this like <laughs> it's hard to, it's my it's hard to know <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. It's, it, there is there is always a danger, and, and again, you know, speaking as an artist, there's always a danger of people overreading decisions you've made because you know sometimes you do them because time constraints sometimes you do them because that just happened to be the one you picked that day and if it was a different day you'd have picked a different one and then Ooh. people can sometimes read a lot in, into it but it, absolutely i mean the idea of it's being a witchy color and and uh, i think you pointed out that the purple and the the green are kind of fighting colors They're, they're you know that's all very interesting and stuff i've never paid attention to to my yeah. shame <laughs> i mean even just i think for me the one that feels really deliberate rather than just you know these are the the eight yeah, colors choices. i've got in my palette is the way that we start with that very saturated background mm. in the first sort of division yeah. of the panel and that background fades out that sort of sense of if you were doing this as a tv thing as a filmic thing you know the sort of overlaying of these images that they would get sort of more blurred and more mm. uh, that sense of a greater sense of unreality and then that final panel snaps back to that yeah, same yeah. rich teal there's that that moves my eye through it and there's yeah. a sense of 
uh, continuity and then bam discontinuity yeah. back to where we were and like that oh that that to me because a lot of what i was studying with the artificial intelligence is, is our visual system and particularly the point of our color visual system because it's really mm. expensive but it does some amazing things for us in terms of navigating the natural world and i yeah i i feel something about that background gradient that someone's gone okay this is where color doesn't just sort of add pretty it does something for the storytelling mm. and it, yeah i'm not sure if that's deliberate but it, it oh, no i, it, I it think makes that, i me think feel that may well be. <laughs> yeah no I, th I think you're right i mean there is and as you say there is a kind of it's almost like look i'm you know i'm going to show you what i'm like as a you know the different aspects of me but no this is this is now this is now and yeah. this is what you're getting and it does yeah. feel like that and i i think the artwork contributes to that but the colors do as well even if it's for me it's always been a very subliminal thing that i've never really mm -hmm. noticed or paid attention to although again I, I like have my first exposure to this is probably in the in the black and white one thing i'm not 100 percent sure of is in the comics how many of these versions of merlin we've ever seen so i know <laughs> i know i think we've seen we because this sort of techno um techno it's kind of slightly balding kind of long gray hair no beard uh look is definitely an invention of the alan moore alan davis run um the you know, the black bearded uh, very typical evil wizard look is possibly something from the comic but i i feel like the the one that we, we've kind of referred to as the alan moore like is is uh <laughs> is probably closest to one that we've definitely seen in the comic the ming the merciless no idea where that came from the the ant the, the furry ant thing <laughs> what is that about but it, but it's kind of interesting to to see the that there's an alien in there as well you know i mean later on this this strip would go to um i mean essentially this opened up the multiverse to to marvel comics there was no i don't think there was a big multiverse prior to this but this opened up strips with multiple versions of captain britain and and you know captain earth strip one from from a, a kind of 1984 a version of uh, of the um marvel universe and stuff and and there i think there's a later on there's a funeral on other world where you see all of these various captain britons attending a, a a single funeral so it's um but there's a you know and this strip is just brilliant it is it is prior to alan moore doing um miracle man or marvel man and it's prior to the watchman and it's a r prior just a little bit to v for vendetta but it's mm. it's sort of a prototype to a lot of those ideas and and you know it's it's just ah, it's right in the sweet spot for me for <laughs> alan davis and alan moore art it's just the, the sweet spot for me astonishingly hard to get though really difficult right. to get because at the time yeah at the time it was being published marvel uk had different licenses and so um they actually were publishing stuff that the, they were publishing doctor who comics as well and alan moore wrote a lot, a lot of doctor who comics and characters from the doctor who strips would turn up in the captain uh Britain strips as well. They would turn up in in both things. So there's a there's this, um, a, a team called the uh, special executive. I think they're called to who oh, turn yeah. up in in Captain Britain, who were also in Doctor Who, although they were a, d a slightly different team. That was a sort of in the, this team had a timeline where there were different team members, and so they had a slightly older team. So, um, but it, so that, I think that's made that's muddied the water for reprints. There, uh, there is then, a there is a collected paperback edition that I've seen in the last ten years. So I think they found. Yeah, I, I have that. It. That's what this is from. But and there's a new right. com, there's a new collected edition coming out. I think, but like aside from that and if, in fact i think if you go to ebay now to pick up the collected edition for it, it's like 60 quid or something it's you know it's it's outrageously expensive but there is a there is a massive collection coming out soon which i think collects the dave thorpe run prior because it's been interesting the dave thorpe run prior to this is kind of a lot of the right ideas but not the execution is a bit sort of you know it's a kid's superhero comic and then alan moore takes over and it's like i've got to reset a lot of these things and then explore and play with them and that was very much our experience at the time wasn't it alan moore yeah. taking over because shortly after yeah. he took over swamp thing as well yes Yes. Uh, it, yeah, and and just the 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 level of ability just suddenly it was a great time to be alive, Kev. <laughs> we were we were a lucky generation. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, the... I, I often I often think because you sort of forget how youthful comics is as an industry, that it's you know maybe a hundred years old, but but it's but certainly the comics that we all think of, it's it's almost like uh, pop music 
you you don't think of pop music prior to 1950 you know it's 1960 on onwards so mm-hmm. giants walk among us now you know you know like uh, today particularly uh, the rolling stones drummer died and she kind of realized well we, we are among giants there there's no there's no you don't realize it until they die or something happens to them but but to be alive at the time that Stanley and Jack Kirby and Alan Moore and Alan mm-hmm. Davis and, and when these kind of giants of the industry are, are there it's it's a kind of wondrous it's an amazing one of life's gifts to you that you that you totally take for granted you know yeah and to see the big steps the big step changes that happen in comic book creation this period the 1980s has more than its surrounding decades mm. i think the 60s was a big time the 40s or the late 30s a, a big time uh, there's some eras which have not so much going on and yeah when Just alan Pablo- Moore- just Alan Moore kicking water under the feet. <laughs> Frank Miller at the same time. It was quite, yeah. quite the time. Right. Well, we've just been spending an awful long time looking at the Captain Britain uh, by Alan Moore and Alan Davis, the panel that was brought in by Paul Holden. And now we're going to have a look at the panel that Emma Byrne has brought in. And we've focused in close on one panel, although I also have the page that this comes from. Let's have a look. Okay. okay. Oh, I know exactly what this is from. <laughs> oh, brilliant. I thought you might. <laughs> well, well, Can you avoid... guess why I chose it? To avoid spoilers for the listener <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. at home. Well, listener... first of all, I'll try and figure out what the hand line, the, the sign language is. Will I? So, okay, that, uh, listener at uh, home, can I just describe what we're looking at? In case you oh, can't yeah, yeah. see these pictures, uh, we are looking at a main central image of a silhouette picture of a man in a wheelchair uh, grabbing hold of uh, a, a man standing up who's holding a bottle that's spilling so it's a domestic argument uh, between and it's man- all in silhouette in silhouette uh, silhouette man in wheelchair and uh, possibly younger man uh, standing up and above that there are three symbols which are showing uh, sign language symbols there's a, a hand holding up uh, three fingers index finger and next and along then there's a hand holding clenched fist but with one index finger looped over thumb and finally hand holding up with just index finger with thumb looped over it uh, you can probably read those from my descriptions my descriptions were so good okay um <laughs> that's palm palm face nightward when those because i don't know if if uh back of hand face nightward with three letters up is different than palm Palm face nightwards okay. with three letters up. I'd imagine they w- they are, but I don't know. Right, because Paul knows what this is from, and so does Emma. We're going to show the whole page. Actually, the... I think I sent you a different page. Oh, you did this... send me a whole page. I well, that's did, rubbish. But this, I, that's I, a I, different. But that's <laughs> that. <laughs> ah, but there is a I'm, reason why, Kev. There I'm is go- a reason I'm going why. Back to, I'm going back to the original because this is the one okay. that the reader right. at home will see. So, yeah. uh, right. Paul. So let, let me let me let me. Tell so I'm assuming there's there's a little bit of surrounding like. To be fair, if I'd just seen the silhouette, I might have struggled to guess what this was. But I've seen the surrounding. There's little half a surrounding panel around each of it. And I can tell from the colouring and the art style what this is exactly. Um, and it is a um, a comic that came, when it came out, I think was quite revolutionary in what it was doing. Um, the artwork is both simple and complex um it's it's sort of surface level very simple but that kind of level level of simplicity is very hard to achieve like it's super hard to achieve and also it, it did this thing where it would break down sequences into kind of little bite-sized chunks so it would sort of describe them very very well so i, I don't know what the sign language is I, let, let me put it like that i mean i had a guess but, but what that's is the, the number comic? three what oh what is the comp do you want me to tell you com- i was going to go all the way around the houses it is um uh, it is Matt Fraction and David Aja's uh, Hawkeye. Am I right? Correct. That is right. <laughs> book nineteen. Um, I, I had to. I wouldn't have got the book number. <laughs> I had. I, well, I had to look it up because I, I gave away my. I had so. I had so many copies of the trade in which this was collected, and I keep giving it away. And then it got to the point where I couldn't get it anymore, so I had to go and re-purchase it from Comixology so I could be ready for this episode. Uh, but yeah, uh, Hawkeye has lost his hearing in uh, in a fight. Uh, and had also lost his hearing as a child, was deaf as a child. Um, and this is a fight between him and his brother, which is brewing throughout the entirety of this comic book. 
And the thing that I love is that I came to comics very late in life. And I think it was probably comics e-readers that helped me, the guided view version of it, because I didn't have older brothers or blokes, you know, male friends who would show me how to read a comic. So I was kind of taught how to read a comic by comics book apps. And I got so into it. And David Adger and Matt Fraction's Hawkeye series was the one that I think really oh it just solidified me i mean i nearly brought deadpool and i also nearly brought uh the amazing adventures of lovelace and babbage but in the end it's like what's the one that stayed with me this long and it's this arc in which you are made to feel like an outsider if you don't speak american sign language and as someone who has always loved code breaking and has always loved language having a comic book a comic episode in which dialogue is usually blank bubbles in this there's a lot of blank bubbles the, the shape of the bubbles is very indicative of tone so they're very jagged when his brother uh, Barney is yelling at him but there's nothing in them or there are other ones where the typography of it is very mixed up and there are bits that are bracketed and as someone who struggles a little with my own hearing that idea of something that it, it could be this word or that word, you having to kind of guess from context, you know, he's the son of a bench. And then this is way before um, The Good Place used, you know, these sort of illusions of swearing, but this use of, of slightly corrupted hearings. And it reminded me when you're talking about in 2000 AD and the, the dyslexia becoming part of the, the slang and the swearing that's used. Mm. Uh, but this idea of being made to be a little bit of an outsider. And then they've given you enough clues it's beautiful they're just enough clues if you don't speak asl to start to understand some of the finger spelling and that is because they've given proper nouns throughout the book so at the very beginning hawkeye is finger spelt and then later on when they're in the doctor's office um the his brother is is spelling clint and you know that it must be Clint because it's five letters and he's looking at him. And so you know that the, the clenched fist with the thumb between those first two fingers is a T. And the three fingers up, it does, you know, iconically it is kind of a W. And you just, what is going on here? What could be being <laughs> said here? <laughs> WTF. What the yeah, fuck? Yeah. And so partly it resonates with me with the swearing, but also it's the code breaking. And that, that moment at which you're sort of going, okay, I'm starting to resettle into this world where I haven't been able to understand the communication and now some of it's starting to make sense and that idea of experiencing Clint's journey of I don't understand to I partially understand to there is more dialogue in straight text later on to yeah okay I can comfortably communicate now and you were taken through this emotional journey through the distancing effect if you don't use ASL of this form of sign language but you're given enough clues by the writer and the artist Fraction and Aja to to immerse yourself into it to treat it like a code and to puzzle it out like a mystery book and the other thing I love in terms of colouring, it's not in this one. I think it's in, it's one of the ones that's collected in Little Hits. But David Ager talks about how he treats colour both on the page, but also throughout the book. And he gives the layout of the entire book and how the colour palette changes through the book over the pages to change the feeling of the story and then in this one where you have two things that are going on it's a very muted cool dark greys greens browns whenever you're in Clint's uh, hearing loss world and then whenever you see flashes of his childhood it's very sort of orange yellow red lots of sort of hazard colours this, this scene of a, a domestically violent family in which he is a misfit and then when you see the the, the tracksuit bros who are the antagonists protagonists in this um that that is all in its own color palette as well so it's very clear on some of the pages at the end where he's communicating you know this is me here and this is why you know this is what's happening with the 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 tracksuit bros the clashing of those colors on those few pages is this real sense of you know you can't use actual sound to tell people what is, you know, what is going on. There's um, a transition from 
so I do a lot of stage uh, tech stuff and I work with a sound engineer who uh, is so over this and whenever it happens in shows he get, uh, or TV programmes he gets really mad but that idea from, uh, from background, uh, sorry, theme tune goes to something diegetic, something where you can see where it is in the scene but audio uh, in, in TV and in film you can use all sorts of clues as to, you know, is this flashback, is this memory, is this something that's coming from somewhere else to do that flat on the page using mm. the colour palette as saying this is what's in the room with you this is what's being spoken about uh, it, it is just so clear and I, I loved the way that this comic this particular story is basically you will feel so at home in here if you are part of the deaf community the asl signing community you're at home in this comic if you're not you have to try to you have to experience what it is like to not be at home and and there's just enough of a hint to to drive the curiosity of what is being said here so if you could go back to that page of the 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 full page that i gave you um where we're talking about clint's diagnosis um so there is the you know what is being typed on the doctor's screen and, and clint you know you see his eyes and again i love that whole idea of splitting a panel into multiple panels yeah. so what we've got here at the top is clint's eyes are about a what one sixteenth strip across the top mm. but a split into four columns as the typing underneath which is a slightly deeper row is is also split into four columns this idea of his face being completely static for the period of time it takes to write down his diagnosis of deafness and then his brother and the doctor talking in such a way that Clint cannot hear anything, They're just open speech bubbles. And then at the very bottom, you see the finger spelling of Clint. And it's that is your first clue as to how you can possibly understand what's going on. Uh, so it, it, my screen, unfortunately, doesn't render very well the bottom part of screen shares, but those five little icon iconographic panels yeah. are the finger spelling of Clint, which gives you the T that later on you can spot from context WTF. Uh, and so, yeah, of course... I feel, I feel like I should point out Matt Hollingsworth did the colours on on oh, Matt Hollingsworth, well sorry, been, yes, yeah, ah, yeah. this is correct. Yeah, just just um, to give credit to the full team. It, right, you know, yeah, for, of course. Oh, I don't know who lettered it though, so I, I yeah. feel bad about that. But, yeah, Matt Hollingsworth, yeah. But, yes, uh, known, Matt Hollingsworth known very well design. for his work on Preacher. Uh, right. Yes. <clears throat> but yeah, so Matt Hollingsworth then, to, to whom all credit should go for the amazing use of palette throughout this series um, and the very conscious use of colour. And as you say, that uh, in terms of ages drawing, the idea of uh, when to put in background and when to leave it out, mm. you know, when to focus on just faces yes. and when to put them in context. These are all such deliberate choices and they are... Yeah. Oh, they're exquisite. On, on that, I mean, on that, on that page we're looking at now, which is the the scene with the the close up of the eyes and so on, and the and the bottom row of panels where there's no no background color at all. Mm. Now it could well be I just asked for no background color there, but the, the decision to to leave that white is mm. it's quite it's a ballsy move to kind of go right no color here. We're just going to leave that because it focuses you entirely on those characters and it brings you into the moment that they're both having together. You know mm. the, that. That that they everything else is out of focus. That they're not concentrating on any any of that, and it's a little like reading in the experience of reading, where you're reading something and and the world vanishes around you. So it it may be given the equivalent of what that would be like to communicate to someone with sign language, where you're feeling that everything's focused on on their movements and on what they're doing with their hands. So it's and interesting. I mean, I, I as someone who doesn't speak any sort of sign language at all uh, or use any sort of sign language, it it probably maybe gives. A, the incorrect impression but it feels like this is, might be as close as i'll ever feel to to that being part of that and you know being that and communicating in that way and mm. thinking very much about what can be done in a comic different from what would happen in another mm. art form we've got the symbols for the sign reading looking very much like uh, explanatory <clears throat> symbols you would get in um, health and uh, uh, security 
the panels on yeah, the walls. Yeah, a little the, airport. The, the, uh, airplane, they remind me of airplane evacuation instructions. Yeah. They, and they integrate beautifully with uh, with how the line drawings on a page work. They're doing what line drawings on a page work. If you turned this into a TV program or a movie, the line drawings on a page would stand out because they were line drawings. And mm. it, it, this and also this page with its beautiful symmetry uh, and the symmetry mm -hmm. is used uh, I can see elsewhere in the book again it's something you can only do when you've got a whole load of images on a page in the way that comics work that, it's and the, really the only, using our art form the only the only scene I've ever seen I think in film and TV where two characters are in a pure white background when Morpheus is talking to Neo in, in the Matrix and that you, you couldn't carry it off in a in a gritty uh, you know day to day I'm sorry, thing. Are you forgetting all of the great sketches of Kenny Everett's video show? Oh, of course, of course. <laughs> all in the best possible taste. <laughs> Thank you, Emma Byrne and Paul <laughs> Holden. We How have... could I forget Cupid's stunt? <laughs> <laughs> we have just been looking at Hawkeye, uh, the stories written by Matt Fraction and drawn by David Ager, and Captain Britain, the stories written by Alan Moore and drawn by Alan Davis. Some wonderful artwork for you to seek out. Uh, if you have any questions to ask us, you should be able to find us all on the socials. Emma, where do we find you on the socials? Yeah, you find me as Sci Ribi, which is, yes, uh, unfortunately, then I have to spell it, but S C I as in science, R, uh, W R I as in writer, and then B Y as in burn, so Sci Ribi. Uh, or you can just pop to emmaburn.net, um, and I usually update where I'm likely to be either talking or appearing uh, on that. Uh, and yeah, have a look for um, How to Build a Human, which is all about how basically your brain develops from birth to, to adulthood. Uh, or Swearing is Good for You, which is what, what your brain does when it realises what exactly being an adult involves. <laughs> there you go. You'll find that wherever you find all your Emma Burns. And uh, Paul, where do we Not find you on the socials? There is another more famous Emma Burn, I should point out. I don't play football for Arsenal oh. or Ireland. <laughs> True. When you Google Emma Byrne, that's what you'll find. Uh, when you Google Paul Holden, you'll find lots of Paul Holden, which is why you go by PJ, I guess. Yes, yeah, PJ Holden is, is yeah, PJ Holden sounds like someone Paul Holden could live next door to you. That's that's so I just avoid Paul Holden. Uh yeah, well, you'll find me on Twitter at Paul at Paul J Holden. Uh, and my blog is uh, www.pauljholden.com. So there we go. And easy, you'll find me at, um, at KevF Comic Artist and the website kevfcomicartist.com. Hey, why not click subscribe to be sure of hearing every episode when it comes out and leave us a review. It always helps. Thank you again to Emma Byrne and to Paul PJ Holden and to you at home for listening. I've been KevF and this has been Comic Cuts, the panel show. And we're out. Yay! Yay! Emma, Thank you, you need guys. to get yourself a middle initial. That's I do. I do. It's it's. I'm I'm Emma Louise, and practically everybody in my class is either an Emma Louise. Well, half and not the boys, obviously, but it's either an Emma Louise or a Sarah Jane. So even my middle initial. So huge <laughs> Doctor Who fans and <laughs> it's weird, isn't it? Like people who were born in '74, there was a sudden sudden spurt of Emma Louises and Sarah Janes, and I kind of <laughs> Sarah Jane, but the Emma Louises, I don't. I have no idea. Yeah, the only no. there is an Emma Louise that I knew. I knew uh, Emma Louise Johnson who. Went on to do TV. Uh, she was a BBC news presenter, or BBC presenter, local right. regional news. So, um, but and she was a. I used to do drama at, at uh, when I was at university, and she would corpse every time. And the fact that she's the one that ended up on TV is a constant, <laughs> constant bafflement to me. But. <laughs> Well, at least when it's when it's news. I mean, was this corpsing as in about to laugh or cor corpsing? Yeah, as yeah, in no, just constant, riot, constantly right? laughing and and oh, uh, you know, God. not, not That's able be to a hold. Danger. Like <laughs> you would think so. A tragic train crash in which thirty-seven <laughs> people. I say tragic. <laughs> it was business people. <laughs> it was bankers. Anyway, uh, yes. <laughs> right, I'm going to stop recording now because.